At the end of World War I, the war powers descended on Versailles to make peace and redivide colonial territories. From the seat of his self-styled empire in Harlem, Marcus Garvey argued that it was time to give Africa back to black people. Some said it was a ridiculous fantasy, but Garvey's slogan, Africa for the Africans, reverberated around the world as his movement spread through the colonies. In Europe, Garvey began to be seen as a threat. The United States had worked with the British government during World War I, and they continued that after World War I with a focus on Garvey, because the British government was deathly afraid that the Garvey movement was going to spread revolution. They feared the hundreds of thousands of the masses of blacks under his influence. And undoubtedly, Garvey did stir up nationalism. Garvey's Negro World, now published in Spanish, French, and English, carried news of rebellion around the world. In Africa and the Caribbean, colonial authorities banned the newspaper. But with over 500 divisions of the UNIA in 22 countries, Garvey's message could not be stopped. In the United States, black troops returned from World War I with high expectations for change. But they returned to a country that was not ready for equality, a country increasingly suspicious of radical political movements. In this unsettled climate, Garvey's appeal to disgruntled African Americans with military training sounded an alarm. Attorney General Palmer decided that there needed to be a special division of the Justice Department. He called it the General Intelligence Division. And he picked a young Justice Department attorney. He was really unknown at that time, but uh, must, have been, must have been known enough for his diligence. And his name was J. Edgar Hoover. Garvey really gets pinpointed. Hoover, the Justice Department, were, were clearly hooked on a fixation on Garvey, which would before long become a vendetta. J. Edgar Hoover wrote to a colleague, Garvey is a notorious Negro agitator, affectionately referred to by his own race as the Negro Moses. Hoover's agents were in the audience at Carnegie Hall when Garvey bragged that the UNIA would soon be strong enough to exact its own form of justice. When those crackers lynch a Negro below the Mason-Dixon line, since it is not safe to lynch a white man in any part of America, we shall press the button and lynch him in Africa. The agent reported that Garvey's address was met with great applause and much excitement. J. Edgar Hoover had long relied on casual informants, but now, in his determination to go after Garvey, Hoover hired the first full-time black agent in the Bureau's history. He was known by a code number. All his reports were signed uh, 800. That was his code. And his job was to go into Harlem and to infiltrate the Garvey movement to try and find evidence that could be used to build a legal case for ultimately getting rid of Garvey. The idea comes to Garvey that black people need a shipping line. And he bases his idea on the fact that the Cunard family has the white star line and the Irish have the green star line. And he says, why shouldn't blacks have the black star line? So it is a vision of grandeur. Black people were routinely Jim Crow on ocean-going liners. Black folk paying, say, for first-class accommodation often had to travel in third-class accommodation. Black people on ships had to eat after the white people had finished eating. So all of these problems Garvey was trying to address through a shipping corporation. His ships would carry more than passengers. Garvey envisioned commercial trade among black communities around the world with produce, raw materials, and manufactured goods transported on UNIA vessels. The Black Star Line 
It was in some ways Garvey's Empire State Building. It was this monument to black commerce in the same way that the Empire State Building was this citadel of white capitalism. And it represented the ability of black people to seize the day and to have their own economy. Garvey offered Black Star Line stock for sale in 1919, promising his investors liberation and large profits as they slept. My parents spent a small fortune in Garvey shares. They were $5 a piece in those days, which was a lot of money. And my mother had to remind my father that uh, there was food and things to be bought because he was buying shares. And Daddy had those on his dresser. And I remember reaching out to touch them. And Daddy said, touch them and feel the power that the black man will someday know. Just months after his first stock offering, Garvey stunned the world with the purchase of the Black Star Line's first ship. Let our steamship sail the high seas. Not one, not two, but hundreds of them. The stronger we become upon land and sea, the more will be the respect shown to us and the greater will be the glory. The SS Yarmouth, a 33-year-old wartime coal boat that Garvey planned to rename the Frederick Douglass, would set sail with an all-black crew under the command of Joshua Coburn, a black captain. One bright November morning in 1919, Garveyites assembled on the pier at 135th Street in Harlem to witness the launching of the Yarmouth. A spectator said, we watched people jump up and down, throw up their hats and handkerchiefs, and cheer while the Yarmouth backed from the wharf and slowly glided down the North River. The ship appeared to embark on a spectacular ocean voyage, but because Garvey had not finished paying for it, the Yarmouth went only as far as the 23rd Street Pier. But when the Yarmouth finally made its maiden voyage, it was cause for an international celebration. The president of Cuba threw a banquet in honor of the crew, and members of his cabinet purchased shares in the Black Star Line. In Costa Rica, workers descended on the docks to shower the Yarmouth with fruits and flowers. It was announced that one of the ships of the Black Star Line would be coming to Panama and going through the canal. As a very small boy at the time, and my brother and I were given packed lunches, sandwiches, and drinks, and were packed off to a place called Christchurch by the Sea, waiting to see this Garvey ship arrive. We got there at about 9, 10 in the morning, midday, no ship, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, no ship, but we were still there waiting. 9 o'clock, no ship. At about 9.30, 10, my brother put me on his back and we were on the way home. But the ship never actually came. There's no denying the fact that Garvey's Black Star Steamship Line was a wonderful symbol. It was a powerful symbol. But it was nothing more than that, I think, a symbol. The fact that people would come down to the docks waiting for these ships in some ways is metaphoric for the wishful thinking that was largely at the heart of the Garvey movement. Garvey was betrayed by the few people he trusted to get the Black Star Line afloat. The man he asked to inspect the Yarmouth turned out to be an informant for J. Edgar Hoover. And his hand-picked captain, Joshua Coburn, convinced Garvey to pay six times what the ship was worth, and then took a kickback from the purchase price. Yet Garvey quickly raised and spent $200,000 on two more ships. And making a purchase of those liners without being led by experts, he was deceived about uh, the condition of those, of those ships, and 
overpaid for, for their own, what their value should have been. It was a disaster for the movement and turned out to be a disaster for Mr. Garvey. <laughs>